two, one. Here we go! Delighted to be joined by former Galway senior hurling and goalkeeper uh, James Gehill. Um, I suppose James, when you air announcing your inter-county retirement, how much do you kind of have to put into the statement to try and sum it up, I suppose, um, on social media these days now? Oh, that's a good question. I haven't actually been asked that in all the questions I've been asked recently. But uh, look, if I, for me, everyone's different, you know. Um, some people, let's say, would like to put in, you know, essays, you know, <laughs> real long statements, let's say. So like, I looked at uh, C.J. Sanders' <clears throat> you know, message about retirement, and that's warranted because, he's, you know, he's a, like a foreign national coming into a country that he ultimately fled for, you know, and had 50 caps for, like, and he had a long statement thanking the whole host of people. That was perfectly sound, in my opinion. Uh, a GEA background, I think, you know, short and sweet, you know what I mean? Thanking the people that matter. And it's impossible to thank everyone on an individual basis, so you just you group them collectively and like that. Just thank everyone, say it's great times, move on. You know, so a, sim- a, sing- a single one tweet uh, was enough for me. But others, look, again, it depends what you're like. It depends if you want to thank people uh, specifically or thank, you know, mention certain moments in your career, etc. You can make it as long as you want after that. But for me, it's just one tweet, move on. And was it always going to be retiring, I suppose, at the end of the 2020 season for you? Um, no, actually, do you know what? Uh, if you asked me that question probably more than 12 months ago, I would have said no. Um, I just found the COVID season, what I call the COVID season, let's call it the 2020 season, I found it difficult, you know. Um, maybe it's because of where I was, let's say my age, the mileage on the clock, you know, the difficulties you get with the work and trying to couple all that with, with, <clears throat> with your sport, you know. It just, for me, it wasn't quite as enjoyable as, as the years previous. You know, because it was very much a controlled environment, uh, which the guys did a great job of doing, you know. Um, and it was very much kind of like a business setting. Again, this is only my opinion, but you come into the training, you do your training, you're gone. You know, there's no, there was no real, I suppose, the camaraderie of it all was, was kind of, I won't say diminished, but it was definitely severely impacted. And, you know, you couldn't really share a meal, you couldn't share a team bus, you know. You couldn't sit down in the restroom and really have a chat. You know, when you're out on the pitch thing, you're kind of trying to avoid groupings. It's kind of just train, 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 get in, get home. So I suppose the whole experience was was different from what I was used to. And I just didn't see myself, you know, going through, going through that again. And like, that's not the only reason, you know, as I said to you a moment ago, mileage, age on the clock, uh, family, you know, work commitments, all that kind of stuff pooled together. And it just ultimately led me to say, look, it's time to move on, you know. Because for the last 13, 14 years, uh, hurling would have been, you know, very close to number one. Uh, more, like when I say number one, I mean uh, the number one priority in all my life. So with, between work, relationships, uh, kind of start, I suppose part-time work was farming and then hurling. I would have always put relationships and hurling as one kind of side by side, you know, different types of love, which is, it's a, I suppose, a controversial thing to say in this house. But, um, you know, so when you get to this age, you put all them together and you try to make a sound judgment uh, and what's, what's best for everyone, not just for yourself especially when you've got a wife and, and children, you know. Yeah, and you mentioned the COVID season there, like just showing up, training, I suppose, getting your meals in the package nearly, and then going home. Do you feel like within the inter-county setups, like you'd always hear inter-county players talking about the crack you have with teams and everything. Do you feel that was missed uh, in 2020? Yeah, but it was like, the answer to the question is yes, it's definitely missed, you know. How do you maintain that kind of crack? And how do you, I think you just have to kind of find, you know, new ways to have enjoyment. Let's say I, I, I would have said about Shane and the guys last year that, you know, they did a real good job during the lockdown of trying to keep interest in, in the panel itself because well, I suppose when lockdown hit, everyone became very individualistic and you know, kind of selfish and in one way to look after their own corner on a personal level. And so the kind of the hurling and the whole team ethos kind of got put aside. But as I said, they did a good, a good job of, of introducing, you know, kind of competition in-house like putting us into teams and and just it was a just it was a fresh input it's a different way of doing things like we wouldn't have been used to before um so like let's say a group of panel of 36 is six groups of six or so on, and you create like a, bit, a little mini league so and again like every ga player or country player or club player or whatever they crave competition so like when, when that league was created and a bit of the banter started in the whatsapp group 
it was a different element of crack, you know. And so then when we got back training, that was still carrying on, let's say, whoever won the whoever won the league, you know, because there was probably some decisions on the on the corrections of the marking that were a bit uh, questionable, should I say. So yeah, it was just it's just it's finding a way of doing things different, you know. That's what last year was all about, was trying to trying to adapt to what was put in front of you. Because it's not it's not a season of norms, so like that what you've done before and what was normality was completely just thrown upside down. So I was trying to find new ideas, trying to find new methods, and then really group them together and see what you can what you can make of the season as, as a whole. Absolutely. And like before you announced your statement, like did did you have to did you I suppose just give a heads up to all the players and management and were you able to do that in person at all? Um in person no. No, in person no, because we were still in the middle of a oh, I'm not sure what level lockdown it was. I can't really remember. There's been so many now in the last <laughs> 12 months. But um I, I couldn't do it in person. Like I'd be very close with a couple of guys. Um like the likes of um you know, I'd be very close to Aiden Hart, very close to Johnny Cohn. You know, so like those guys I would have talked to, I'd have kind of, you know, I'd have trashed the idea back with them back and forth and we'd have discussed it like adults. You know, there wouldn't have been any, you know, lies being told between us. Like it'd be straight talk, I'd say, for, 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 for want of a better phrase. And I suppose really it was those guys I would have talked to um, on a regular basis when I was toying with the decision. And then obviously I couldn't meet Shane either. He's down in Limerick. I was in Galway. Restrictions, distance and travel, et cetera, all came into play. So I would have called Shane, you know, and just kind of give him the heads up. And uh, in fairness to him now, like he, he, he did say, just look, kind of take more time to think about it. And you know, if you're definitely certain within a, a week or two, you know, fair enough, I will respect your decision. So he couldn't have been nicer about it, you know. So I was kind of nervous about telling Shane because I thought he might, you know, he wouldn't know how people react, you know, if you're, you just don't know. I, it's very hard for me to explain or even to, you know, to kind of put into words what I was trying to think at the time. Maybe he nearly hold it against you somewhat if you're, do you know what I'm trying to say? Yeah. But he didn't. He couldn't have been someone. He couldn't have been nicer. Good gentleman. And what's the one thing you, you're going to really miss uh, from the inter-county game, do you think? Oh, people. People. No doubt about it, yeah. Like, I have huge respect for everyone that, that has kind of contributed to that, that setup. Um, you know, what I mean by that is obviously the players, like, have great friends, you know. Like, I suppose I'm on the panel for 13, 14 years when you count of all the players that you played in that time. You know, you're heading into the not just the hundreds, like it could be up in a thousand. Who knows how many players they played with? Um, but even people like who would have helped me a lot throughout, throughout the career, like I, like Sir Lucas and the SNC, I'd, you'd miss him, like you'd miss like Tex, the kit man, I had a great relationship with him, you know? All these people, let's say, that you see in a nearly a day in, day out basis when you're, when you're playing inter county because it's almost like a seven day a week thing. Um, so those people, I won't say you've lost them in your life, you know what I mean? But you, kind of the relationships won't be what they were, you know? Um, and he, like you won't see them as much, you won't be in contact as much, obviously for obvious reasons. So definitely for me, it's the people because those relationships, although they're life, they're 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 they'll, they'll last for life, but you won't quite have the best benefits as you've had before, you know. And how do you think you're gonna feel like going to games? Well, you mightn't even get to go to games this year, but as a supporter, like watching go mm-hmm. on this year. You're the second man to ask me that question today. <laughs> <laughs> so hopefully. I've, I've rehearsed the answer, but um, <laughs> look, this might come as a small bit of a shock, but I'm not the biggest hurling fan. You know, I'm like I love playing the sport, I love training for the sport. You know, I love preparing for the kind of battles of the sport. But as it's going to sound terrible, nearly as an inventor, respect, I'm not really into going to hurling games. You know, and that people are surprised when I say that to them. I'm more into you know, NFL or rugby, that kind of gets me, I'm more of a fan of those sports as such, right? And I do realise that I'll have to be, I will be attending games with my, like with, with the kids, let's say, when they, when they start playing and when they want to go see Galway, you know, Hurling or Camogie, that's when I'll probably start going to games on a more regular basis, but, you know, I just, I, I don't see anyone at, at games this year anyways, with the way COVID is going. But I suppose, like, it'll take me time. I, I, I'll, I'll dip my toe into it uh, every I mean, now and then, do you know what I mean? I won't be like a, a religious supporter. I won't be going to every game, but you know, we'll, we'll pick and choose the ones that are for the most excitement, should I say. <laughs> and like overall, like a great career for Galway between 2007 and 2020. How do you look back on it all? Jesus, yeah. Can you put those years into perspective? Um, I look, look at it. I look back on it fondly. You know, a uh, common question I've been asked, if any regrets, you know what I mean? One or two, let's say, nothing major, but like overall, as 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 
you know, a full term of 13 or 14 seasons. Like I have great memories. I've made great friends. Like I've accomplished, accomplished a bit, you know, had great experiences with, you know, with games in Crow Park and Perlis and even getting, you know, foreign travel games in Fenway Park and in Australia. So I'd say that that, that inter-county career was a great period of my life that I look back on very fond, you know. Um, I nearly remember certain times, you know, with, 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 with the guys, they say it could be on a team bus or in a pub or on, you know, after the game that I will I remember more than the game, you know. So like that's that's what you that's what you'll miss. But, but again, that's what you look back on, you know. So like I, I think I think we've had that, we've had some great times and, and it'll kick into your head every now and then, you know, you could be driving the car heading to Dublin to work and next thing you just think of a story or some what some some lad said and you could be laughing to yourself in the car for 20 minutes, you know. <laughs> so that's that's the great things you can take out of it. And you mentioned the one or two regrets. What are they for you? Oh God, I shouldn't have mentioned that. <laughs> Um, look, I, I suppose as a regret, I, I regret that I didn't get to finish a couple of the finals, you know. Ultimately, that was taken out of my control, you could say, with, with, with injury, which is fair enough, right? But uh, that, that's a bit of a stinger. Uh, I, I regret that my last game in Crow Park was, was, uh, was the, the 18 final against, against Limerick. So, you know, I would have liked to get one kind of not to set a record straight, but even just to finish a full 70 minutes, for God's sake, on the pitch, you know. Yeah, and, and and let that be your 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 last game in Crow Park, you know. But um, other than that, look, as let's as we made some mistakes along the way, we made up for them, and we move on. So, I guess I won't look, I won't look back at them too negatively, and they won't uh, they won't take too much space in my mind. I put it that way, yeah. Exactly, and like an unbelievable career. But like, I heard you mention in like one or two pieces, like the commitment levels of the intercounty game, and I suppose when you're mm-hmm. working, when you're farming, you have a family and everything. How big of an actual commitment is the intercounty game? Um, it's very big. You know, you know, like you've again hard to explain. Like, like my mother now, my wife would 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 know what I mean when I talk about this. But you've got like the physical preparation, the physical time. And you've got the mental preparation, the mental time. So like, we get our schedule. You know, it could be a month in advance or whatever. It could be a fortnight in advance, and your life revolves around tinkering things to make sure that you're the best prepared for that session or that game or whatever, that meeting, et cetera. So ultimately your whole life is structured towards the game. So yes, you mightn't actually have, you know, 40 hours a week of training, but I'm telling you, you have a hundred hours a week of thinking, managing everything, trying to, trying to move the pieces around on the board to make sure that you're, you know, you're not going to arrive for seven o'clock if you're in Dublin, you know what I mean? So it's, it's kind of, it's a huge commitment. Like, the physical toll, it is what it is. The game is getting faster. The guys are getting stronger. So you have to put more time into getting stronger, more time into getting faster. There's more sessions. There's more demands of you. You know, that's obvious. But the mental toll of it all, to keep all that going, as well as the other things in your life, obviously, like as, as you put in my instance, with the farming or with work or with, 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 with family, etc., it, it comes a huge commitment. You know, I, I do hate to see comparisons. I've read a couple of articles before about comparisons about the training, you know, or, GA guys do an average 25, 30 hours, you know, for a week of travel, and then all athletics could do 60. And you know, fair enough. I I I take that on board, right? But if you actually quantify the hours of thought, preparation, you know, organization for, for GA players, you know, especially mainly because they're amateur and trying to move everything around, like you're heading into serious series hours a week, you know, serious hours a week. And it's not just seasonal either. So, like for obvious reasons, you the the, the the county guy is going for, realistically speaking, from you know from a training perspective with Galway, with Galway, for example, you could start in November, maybe the end of November, and you can go right through, potentially, if you're successful in the season, through the end of August. And the old structure was mid-September, and then straight away you're into club again. So it became a 12, 12 month process, you know? And so like then like county guys, the way I look at it, they're, they're, they're programmed. So when they go back to clubs, they do the exact same thing for the club, same kind of preparation, the same thought, you know? So it's just kind of a year on, you're sorry, it's a day in, day out kind of thing. So it's uh, it's intensive, you know. And like you mentioned there, like coming from Dublin, even going to training, like yeah, like would you find it hard to like even keep your body like in good shape? I suppose because oh, when you're coming out of the car, yeah. like from Dublin, like you're bound to be a bit stiff from all that driving as well. Oh, it's torture. Like I, I again, I refer to another article I read. I think it was about. Uh, I think it was about Chris Barrett from Mayo 
he mentioned they got a minibus back from Dublin up and down to go training, you know. And it was just he was taken through his kind of life cycle of how he managed his time and his hours. And I'd say to the, to the normal Joe Soap, they, they would have read the article and go, my God, that's not living at all. But for the likes of us reading it, it's going, yeah, that's, that's normal, you know. Obviously, you've got the physical toll. The physical toll is terrible because you could come out of Dublin at, say, you have to leave at three o'clock or whatever, get through the traffic and you head down the road, um, try not to speed too much. <laughs> and then you land in Athen Rye and you're straight and trying to prepare your body. And as I said earlier on, you know, it's not even your age, but it's the mileage you've done both on the pitch and on the road, you know, that all accumulates. Before you know it, you need what, what, what you used to take 10 minutes to prepare for training goes to 20. And then you get into your 30s and then it takes 30 minutes preparation and 40 minutes preparation. So whereas now, even if I'm doing a club session, I, I know I need a half an hour to get certain muscle groups or the body ready enough for training. So like it's 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 a real taxing toll, say, especially if you've long distance to travel. That's why I do give a good break to the teachers <laughs> <laughs> during the summer, especially when they're off. They have it handy. Yeah. And do you think there's any answer like for the intercounty game, like with people coming from Dublin and managers there inspected them to be at that training? Yeah. Um, again, look, again, however controversial this may be, I do believe the players should be paid. Uh, I'm not saying paid full time. Uh, I do think that they should be at least get some sort of exemptions, whether it be tax or part time payments, that they can allow them to maybe possibly do a part time job and to train at, at, a, at a very, very high level. The word professional is thrown out a good bit when it comes to GEA. Yes, you know, in writing, we're not professional, that's a fact. Uh, however, in application and time spent, it is professional, you know. And I do think the, the 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 finances are in order to provide teams to or to provide clo- counties that say, especially from from a national level, let's say from Crow Park down, that you could have a semi-professional outfit. You know, so I do think what's the answer? Um, that's the only answer I can see. Like someone could provide a very good argument against that. So that's fair enough. That's their opinion. Um, beyond that answer, I don't have too many others. You know, like everyone has to work for the same. You're fully amateur. You have to work. You have to provide for your Care insurance, your mortgage, etc. So there's no way around that, you know. And like in my in my instance, you know, my employer is all was was very sound and very accommodating to me. So he allowed me to structure my own time accordingly. Whereas other employers mightn't, you know, they mightn't allow you to do that. So again, it's hard to find ans- answers, and I think it's going to become more apparent in you know the next couple of years because, as I said earlier, the preparation levels are going up and up and up. Like every year, you see a team and you go, "Geez, they're in super nick." In the following year, some other team comes along and is in better nick, and then it just grows and grows. Because like if you look at Kenny of, let me see, Kenny of 2007, 2008, you thought they were a machine group, you know, and then let's say I suppose along we came along. Then let's say from like sort of 15, 16, 17 for size, the next thing Limerick could come along. You know what I mean? So you're always trying to beat the next opposition, and the only way to beat them is to is to obviously box a bit smarter or do more. So and often often in GEA terms, teams do more, you know? Yeah. So, like, it's, again, it's hard to get around it, you know? Yeah, I think it's a good point you make about the professional because, like, even you've probably seen the strength and conditioning has went up statistics. Like, GA are nearly doing everything they're doing in every sport, but they're managing yeah. full-time jobs with yeah. that as well as playing the game. And, like, did it frustrate you a small bit when... It wasn't elite this year, and it was elite last year as a whole, the intercounty game. Yeah, I just thought they, they picked and choose what suited them. Do you know, it's an elite sport, no matter what way you look at it. Again, like, as I said earlier on, like, say, we, there's a lot of people in this country, let's say, who, you know, there's a lot of finger pointing and they, they create debate for no reason whatsoever. You know what I mean? And, like, you'll, you'll get people who stick to the absolute letter of the law when it comes to the wording. So, yes, uh, as I said, GA, GA is not professional. But to say they're not elite, that's a bit disingenuous, to be honest. You know, like if you so if you look at the Ireland final, let's say, or any kind of game, should I say, let's say, at, in in the top tier, uh, you've got such a spectacle. Like you're, you're you're looking at guys who are at the absolute pinnacle of their sport. There's no one better in the country at that sport. Nobody. A sport that provides, you know, how many hundred thousand people are watching Ireland final day? How many thousand people go to these games every every year? You know, and so to say to say it's not elite, as I said, a bit disingenuous. You know. It's disingenuous. It's absolutely elite sport, both hurling and football, obviously. You know, hundred percent. And like we we're only talking, I suppose, before we came on air, like 
how social media has impacted um like GA in the last few years. Like would there be in a stage like when you're involved in that intercounty setup where someone will come in and like <clears throat> I suppose tell the younger players and players not to be reading comments and stuff on social media like negatively or anything? Yeah. There was a guy like there was, yeah, like we, we would have had, I suppose it, 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 obviously a social media wasn't uh it wasn't I suppose a full part of my career because as you said earlier on, I started off in 07, so there was very limited <laughs> platforms to share on social media there. So it came in kind of what I remember coming in rightly in 11, 12, kind of building that way, you know. And uh, a lot of the a lot of the guys started getting on those platforms. And I suppose when is when how do I explain this now? If if a person in the group is affected by it, you know what I mean? And brings the attention of either a senior player or a management group, then a professional comes in, let's say. So so we we thankfully we wouldn't have had too many guys who would have had a very, very negative pack, impact with it, but we still would have had a person or two who would have been there. Not their their, their job title might not necessarily have been, you know, media manager or or, or kind of a PR person, there, but they would have been given kind of that role that if anyone came into any kind of difficulty. Or uncertainty with regards to social media that you, that you could talk to this person, you know, quietly, you know, indiscreetly, and that, that, that the facility was there. So um, that that was really that's been in the last couple of years, and it's, again, it's an it's an important role, it's a vital role, if you ask me, because you see the impact social media can have on welfare of people mentally nowadays. That again, you're so accessible as a player, so like you make an error in the day of a game, and straight away there could be a guy, uh, you know, aiming a tweet at you. He'll tag you, don't tag your name, and he tweets you, and like it could be something you know horrific that he could say to you. Who knows how that could affect a person? Thankfully, in my career, as it's coming to the end of it, obviously you know you grow a very thick skin over the course of your career. But if that's someone who's only let's say 19, for example, and has had a very po- positive career in 16s minors up along, and then gets exposed to very very negative comments at senior level, like, who knows like how that's going to affect a person? You know what I mean? Like you or I, we can't say no, he'll be fine. You know that. That won't affect him at all, at all. We can't say that. You know, everyone's different. So when negative comments and that kind of stuff are thrown at guys, or even you know guys' families, should I say, or guys' clubs, etc., you know, you're, you're crossing the line. And I just think every player, I, I think, does need to get some sort of education on it. I think that there needs to be a stark realization that among the public as well, and people who call themselves supporters, that they shouldn't be aiming this kind of message or abuse at players. And uh, you know, we're heading towards a grander issue here now, aren't we? You know, when you think about it, like you know. So there's a lot more to cover on that topic. Yeah, and like it's like across every sport, it's just getting worse and worse. And I suppose it's it's nearly these keyboard warriors, but that yeah. are putting out comments. Like you'd have to think like in the next few years that even these social media outlets are going to have to do something because it's just yeah, like worse and worse. I see. Um, I, I should take you up on your point. That, that's a good way of kind of termed it. Like I would have often looked at it as, as accessibility versus accountability so the player uh, or, or even a coach in some instances is, is so accessible you type in their name they're straight away now we know again an argument from made where the player is on the platform you know they're exposed to it, that's bullshit in my view okay you know the player is there for their own reasons is to interact with people and be social etc not to obtain any abuse so accessibility on the on the side of the player then accountability on the side of of what i would call an aggressor you know so a person could type in some random bullshit name playstation 3 joe right and next thing you know he's aiming abuse at you so and you don't know he's you can identify him you don't know where he's from so it becomes very very hard when those people are you know they're not seeing so i agree with you i think social media platforms there has to be a level of serious accountability amongst these accounts you know and i know again you're heading into financial issues with, with these major major corporations where people can have multiple accounts you know so i don't i don't see it happen anytime soon because you know, a much bigger issue at the moment is obviously racism. We see what happened in, you know, in America with the NBA, let's say, and now we're in over in England with the with the Premiership. And you know, every, it's like every day there's a player being exposed to some method of racism. You know what I mean? It's always on social media. It's never to the face, you know, because because the, the boys aren't like the races as they call them aren't, aren't aren't brave enough, you know. So there is going to something has to happen. It has to, you know, it really has to because you know the players are too accessible and. People who make the comments aren't accountable enough. So, it's one for thought. A hundred percent. Um, but like, he, like I suppose when we do look at your goal career, like um, the battle with Colin Callanan to get the number one, <laughs> number one spot. Like, 
it was obviously a hugely competitive environment between you f- for years like yeah it was great yeah and even like if you ask me like who, who would your best mates be over the panel now that you're finished like you know hell is in the top you know he's, he's up there like himself from you know like i said harty johnny Cohen, etc those guys like are you know great friends but colin would be a really good friend talk to him every second third day you know and it's, it's kind of hard because Yes, you're competitors, you know, you're all vying for the same position, same jersey, you know, and really you're kind of, you look at him going, Jesus, like, I can't stand this guy because, you know, he's taking my position or, or vice versa. But look, it was just a good relationship from the off. You know, he came in in 07, same time I did, and we just struck it off. And as that's as we kind of had a common goal, obviously, we wanted, we wanted the jersey, right? But we kind of knew early days that we just had to push each other as best we could, you know, so... I, I've often said that, you know, in his best performances, I would take great solace in the fact that I had prepared him as best we could. And then, like, what, what you see in the pitch from Cullum and that, and that day or that particular game, you know, I contributed to that. That's the way we'd swing it, you know, kind of a positive nature. It's no point being bitter or and, you know, looking at him or even being opposite into the restroom or opposite into the field. That, that did nobody any good, you know. And we knew that ourselves. So it was just kind of trying forces, push it as hard as we can, and, you know, see what happens. Was that, was that hard to have that mindset at the start, at the very start when you came in and you were battling it out, like... Yeah, like, um, the mindset I was coming from, this is, again, a good question, but the mindset I was coming from was, was I was after coming out of 16 minors, uh, and, like a successful period, let's say, where I, I would really have never been really been a soap, you know? So it was really new ground to me. And so it was kind of hard to sort of process that, if you like. When I was five or six years my senior, so that when he got in, let's say in 07, I, I suppose I would have accepted that. Because I would have said, okay, I'm only 19. You know, in, in a year or two, let's say we'll draw, we can we can really make this much more, much more of a contest. And um, then in 08, I got the jersey. And then in 09, I lost the jersey. I, I had an awful year in 09, let's say, on a personal level. And then kind of 10 was a battle, let's say, I got injured in 10, and then I got her back in 12. We shared it in 13, you know, so it was a very up and down, let's say. So the, as the years went on. You know, it became harder, obviously, to accept it, but you just had to accept it. The best one of the team. I said, what, what the hell was the point of being bitter? You know what I mean? 100%. It did nobody any good. You know, so, like, is this as if... And with that, as I said, that worked both ways, you know? Like, if I had the jersey, he pushed me. If he had the jersey, I push him. In the story. And let's see what happens, you know? Like, even said you were good friends there, and I've seen you worked with him, um, with your body trans formation like you you got fairly big like yourself and um like what kind of work did you put into that because the progress just looked like unbelievable from seeing yeah. that pictures of it like i think i came back from i think I came back from america was it because it's many moons ago now but yeah i came back from america and she's like look when anyone comes back from america after a summer you know you're uh you're carrying a bit of poundage you know <laughs> And that's exactly what it was. And I said, geez, call him after starting the gym. And I said, you know what? Like, who better to go to than the mate? He was like, at least he'll, he'll tell you the truth, you know? Like, he won't flip and feed your ego just to get money off you. Like, he'll, he'll tell you exactly where it's at. And I think that the Amazing 12 was the name of the program. And it was just a, and its inception in, in Colum's gym. And uh, so, Aina Ryan and myself did it. And it just took off. It was, no, it was a seriously hard program. not going to lie. Very taxing. Like, you know, you're talking about gym sessions every day of the week. You know, running sessions top of it, and then county train on top of that. So that twelve weeks was 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 the best of torture. But when you got to the end of it, like you were in like fair fair shape and fairness, you know, you know your strength levels are through the roof. Let's say your your size was was too big to be honest for GA. If I'm honest about it, you know what I mean. So we had to come down a bit. Yeah, but uh, again, it was an enjoyable time because you know something different, a fresh impetus and something different, you know. And uh, like I suppose, call them. Again, he, he would have used Ian and, I, Ian and I to kind of tinker with the program a bit to kind of see what works well, what didn't work well. So I think everyone got served well out, you know. And like, what kind of sacrifices would you have had to make to bulk up? Oh, Jesus. Uh, sacrifices. I suppose the biggest one is time, you know, time and effort. Um, because if you were to be at work for eight o'clock, you'd be in the gym on the button at six o'clock. So you need to get the gym session done the first thing in the morning and get to work. Um, you know, like that time is probably the biggest one. Another one for me is diet. My God, like I like my food, you know, and I like large amounts of food. So I'd often say to people, like I train to eat, you know, 
I, I don't mind if I don't lose weight as long as I stay at the same level and I train, train, train because I like to eat what I want, what I want to eat. But the diet got severely changed. I, I ate fish and green vegetables three meals a day for six weeks. Oh my God, yeah. I haven't, I haven't ate courgette since. <laughs> I can't like it. I'm just about eating broccoli. But uh, the diet, the diet suffered. But again, like it all contributed to the program. I suppose that was the science behind it. It worked. But uh, I won't be going back to that too, too soon. <laughs> you know, the day after eating Sunday, after eating about 10 Easter eggs. <laughs> but uh, like as well, um, 2012, like when you finally did um, make the breakthrough, to win the first Leinster title and I suppose to beat Kilkenny so comprehensively like and to win Galway's first Leinster title that must have been so special special yeah because you know <clears throat> look let's be honest it was unexpected you know I think we were geez, I think we we're like four or five to one you know something quite high like something outrageous you know um, we knew we'd be very competitive we knew we'd a good squad uh, we'd have kind of in place to say we we're just kind of starting off our journey but we didn't we did not think and if anyone says they did they're lying we did not think that we would get that start on them and basically have be have the ball for 35 minutes essentially to build up the lead that we did um but it was great you know god it's like there's a the game as you want to win because the further you go out in front the less pressure's on you you know it's the one point victories are the ones that are hardest earned but that was a great time like, like you know kikini were at the peak of their powers yeah, they still had all the, the, the major players in play. Um, John Shefton was still a major player, obviously, as, as was found out at the end of that year. But um, it was a huge breakthrough. It was just, we always knew that we could compete, but we hadn't won anything. So, like, how, how, how high could you compete? So, winning that Leinster was a, was a massive milestone to get us started. And I think it was, I think it was actually the, it was the start of the whole journey that led to 17. You know, it wasn't an overnight success. It was just a, a slow, steady process with a bit of turnover. On, on, on personnel, let's say, and um, you know, we had a couple of ups and downs, but ultimately, I think 12 was the start of getting to 17. Yeah, when you look back at the 12 replay, like you must have just been nearly saying to yourselves that day, like, what were you going to do with Henry Shefflin? Because, like, he really clawed Kilkenny back into that game, like, and... yeah, like, I think, I think we were, we were some five points up with about a couple of minutes to go before half time. And I still don't you know if we if we kind of kept that margin, you know, into halftime, I think we would have put ourselves in a better position. And like, you know, Sheffield had a great, he's a great second half. You know, he did he did he didn't have a great first half because he was marked fierce well by by Fergal Moore and Tony Ogle say, but he had a great second half. He was very, very influential. And it was very hard to stop, you know. When a player like that gets into that kind of form or gets kind of clicks into that kind of mode, like it's very, very hard to stop that person. You know, they just they get into what you know you'd often hear lads refer to as into his own. You know, and so like, how do you stop a person in the zone? You know, like illegally. How do you stop him legally? I suppose is what I was what you're trying to say. Do you know what I mean? Um, but yeah, he was a great player, and he, again, you've, you've heard him say it himself that it's probably his his fondest victory. You know, which is again, it's hard enough to shake in itself. But look, take the good with the bad, don't you? And like looking back on the, I suppose final and the replay that day, like there was heavy rumours going in, like that you had injured your shoulder, and. Um, mm going in like when you do look back to the replay do you think yourself that you weren't fully fit I wasn't fit no I wasn't fit no that's, that's I don't think I know like I know I wasn't fit um, but again hindsight is fantastic you know uh, when you go back to that that time that, that period let's say or that, that, that couple of days leading to the game you're in a completely different mindset you know than, than, what, than where I am now talking to you uh, and like uh at the time, I thought I was semi-fit, and then it was kind of a collective, a collective decision. It wasn't just me saying I'm going to play, and it was a collective decision amongst management, medical, etc., to you know, to play or not to play. So I suppose that's one one way of looking at it. But whereas when I when I where I stand now talking to you, like just with the hindsight in mind, I shouldn't have really really played. You know, didn't do anywhere in any good team or team or myself. You know, but look at you live and die with the sword, don't you? And you were you were obviously getting a lot of injections, I presume, and stuff like to play. Oh that. yeah, like I had dislocated on the Friday, so sort of so, so, so pop back in on the Friday night. Saturday was a write off uh, on, on painkillers and, and injections, to say, and then you know Sunday was was injection time. You know, and the injections didn't do a bit. They may as well have been pumping water into me. You know what I mean? Didn't do anything for me. So it's just uh, look at again 
it's it's annoying. It's you know what I mean. It's annoying yeah. because like you were there, you were so close to say it was a replay. It was a great game to be the first replay that was in like fifty odd years, you know, or, or something like that, you know. And it was a great occasion to be part of. And then you get you get strict by injury. So again, that's the most annoying part because you want to train all the year, you know, did everything you had to do. Let's say to, to to reach the pinnacle and, and then to have a kind of I won't say taken away from you, but to be suffer such a setback and not be able to participate in it and ultimately not win. That was that was hard, very hard to take at the time. Um, like when you were poking the ball out like in the first half of that game, like were you in agony nearly every time? Uh yeah, I was, yeah. Like I again I said some stupid remarks back then as to as to kind of the pain levels, you know. Uh I just said some awful stupid. You you look back at even embarrassingly so as to what you said to, to national newspapers, but yes, pain pain was high, like, you know. It was uh, it was it's at such a level that I shouldn't have been on the pitch. That's just the way that again, you thought adrenaline would get you over, you thought a couple of injections would kick in, you know, you thought that it would just wear off and say your mind would focus on those things, but again, I just wasn't able to do that, you know. Um you often hear about the guys that say who can in different sports who can kind of put that kind of pain or put that kind of thing into the back of their mind to say, but just that wasn't that wasn't meant to be that kind of day, you know. Yeah, and like your your battles with like Tipperary throughout the years, like when you look back at them games, like even I'd say during lockdown, some of them were on. Like, mm. must look back at them with fond memories because like they've been crackers every time you've met. Yeah, like and they're and like you knew that as well as a player, you know, you knew you were going to into a game. This is this, this wasn't going to be a five point victory or five point loss. This is going to come down to the very very last seconds. You know, you think of uh, two thousand and ten, Dark Car was sunk one under the Hogan. Uh, let's say when Ali Canning had to go off, that was a that was a one point loss, and uh, I think they went on. Yeah, they won the Ireland that year. You know, you look at fifteen, you know, one point. You look at sixteen, one point. You look at seventeen, one point. So it was just their tit for tat battles, and it was because uh, here you win, you win one year this year, we win the next year, and uh, but it was great. Like it was such a great time you know, to be part of. It, you know what I mean? Because nothing more exciting than a big battle coming up, say. And when you come through that battle, sure, it's fantastic, it's huge. You know what I mean? Uh, obviously, when you don't, it's different to get the fish entirely, but they're just, uh, they're a very similar outfit to ourselves. Like, they just like to hurt. You know, systematically, they're not going to throw anything major at you. You're going to have 15 on 15, so it's just throw the gloves off and let's see what happens, you know. And that's the best hurdle, in my, my opinion. Just shackles off, 15 on 15, let's see, let's, see, let's see how this goes, you know. Yeah, and like, when you were during COVID, like, you must have nearly been thinking that even, like, the sunny days going up to play Tipperary in a big game as well. Like you, you probably just would have been thinking about that. Like and the supporters there and everything, and the joy and the emotion. Like even when Joe hits the winner under the kiss yeah. as well. Your cover is hard. So like, and obviously you're, you're you're isolated. You know you're on your own. Uh, so you're kind of you're looking for motivation. You're looking for reason to to train or to get up and do that session. Like because everything else in your body is telling your mind is telling you don't bother. Well, why would you bother? We're not going to play for another six months. You know what I mean? So often you see on TG Cahar or on Air Sport these kind of games back from the you know, 05 on Ireland or even some of the historic games in the 80s like that. That'll get you going, it's it, to push you into the gym or push you onto the pitch again. So, but like, I think, yeah, we lost out last year. You know what I mean? Last the summer, obviously it was a, it was a much bigger issue, national, national issue. So it, it is it, it is what it is or it was what it was, should I say. But, um, because there's more than backs to come, I think. 100%. And like, when Anthony Cunningham did go like there was obviously stuff that went on there but like do you feel it dragged on a bit and like when the media got to know like maybe for players and management it was it wasn't I suppose dealt with the best yeah uh so to answer your question in a couple of parts did it drag on a bit yes of course it dragged on too long um once the media get a hold of it and get involved it becomes messy no matter what way you swing it <clears throat> because public opinion is always going to be way different uh, than, what, than what the truth, you know, the, the truthful opinion should be. Um, was it done smoothly? No, it wasn't. It was a very bad. It was it was a bad way to do things. You know, uh, I'd say looking back, could we could have we done things much different as a, as a player group? I don't think we could have. You know, we couldn't have done much more. We wanted to change. Uh, we wanted a, a better setup. You know, a more professional setup. Let's say, and we stuck to our guns, and it just wasn't accepted. At the time, you know, so and we had to go through a certain process to make sure that it got accepted. And look what happened a couple of years later, one in Ireland, you know. So again, but again, look, nobody needed it. Nobody needed that kind of 
to have anyone's name or anyone's anyone's reputation dragged through a model, dragged through a newspaper or a column or, or, or anything, anything like that to say it should have been done a lot smoother. But again, you have different personnel, and different different opinions, you know, different thoughts to say. I'm sure everyone thought they were right, you know. Yeah. So that, that made the process a lot harder than it needed to be. And was that from a county board like perspective or the management perspective that you weren't being given the supports like you wanted? Hard to know because again, we wouldn't have had access to, to an awful lot of information or an awful lot of, <clears throat> I suppose, conversations or meetings, etc., between boards, delegates, fund, uh, you know, sponsors, management, etc. Like what, what we saw was what we saw on training days. You know, uh, we what we saw what we saw on match days and. You know, like the, the level of facility or, or support we were given, is, that's what we were exposed to, you know. And uh, it just wasn't up there. You know, if you're going to compete against, you know, let's say put it in today's terms with the, with the Limerick's this world, let's say you need to prepare for your swell, you know, you need to prepare very well. And to prepare very well, you need every single stone to be left, you no know, no stones left in turn, basically. And that's anything down to statistics, to nutrition, to it could be down to expenses, it could be down to travel, anything like that. You know, there's loads, there's loads of little things that, that go into the preparation of a team and the, I suppose having having players in the right state of mind and fully prepared. So again, back then we just we just we weren't at the level. We weren't at the level that we needed to be to compete and to compete well and even to win. That was which is our goal. Because we knew we had the four, we knew we had the player group. You know, so like again, time passed passed by so quick. So like you you could lose players for whatever reason. So why we had that player group and that I suppose that that that's real power amongst ourselves, you know, we wanted to make use of it. Yeah, and then, there's better ways to do it. Like it was a tough for you as players, I suppose there probably wasn't as much benefit, but like Connor Whelan's obviously been a huge advocate of mental health with his cousin Niall Dunne, who sadly passed away. But like when that happened, like as players and he played county, which he was was very tough to take. Uh, it was horrible, yeah. You know, there's no, I, I don't know how other ways to describe it, you know. Uh, like, Niall was a very quiet and assuming character, you know. Um, had a very good wit. Um, him being part of, like, the defensive unit at the back, let's say, I would have had a lot of, you know, conversations with him, say, about, you know, different elements of the game, let's say, or technically speaking, or whatever the case is, you know. And, like, he was always a nice, nice fella, you know what I mean? A real nice guy to be around, pleasant guy to be around, you know, a, a supreme athlete, a great hurler, you know. So, like, and he had his career... No, it was all ahead of him. That's the way I looked at it. It was all ahead of him. Like he could have done an awful lot of great things in the game, you know, if you ask me. Um and I just again it caused all of my surprise, you know. Again, I'd be the, I'd admit, I'd be the first to admit that I never got an inclination that there was anything wrong, you know. Yeah. Um obviously because he didn't talk about it, let's say in, in a group setting or with his with his with his county teammates. Um, you know, so I didn't I didn't know he was in that kind of headspace, whatever, whatever way you want to say, like so that's when it came as a complete shock, you know. An awful loss, obviously, um, huge loss, both on and off the pitch. Everyone knows that. Um, but again, it's it like I look at what Connor's doing now at the minute, and you know it's admirable. Like, and is is it necessary? Absolutely. You know, we need we need people in positions of, you know, that that they're called them public figures. You know, anything anything that these public figures can do to, you know, to sway the youth away from you know, the ultimate, uh, is is a positive thing to do. So I, I commend Connor for what he's doing. Uh, more can do it. I think you need to be. I, I do think you need to be suited to that role to do it. You know, and, I, and like Connor is well suited because he's witnessed firsthand. You know the effects it's, it's had on the family. So I think yeah. he's in a great position to kind of share his own experience with. You know, and he's an articulate character. So I think let's say he can convey the message pretty well. And uh, I just, I just, I'd, I'd say to him, keep it up. Yeah, and like it's it's a great point you make because like as we mentioned with commitment levels, like there can be so much going on for a player on and off the pitch, and like as well like with everything that the game involves, like you never really know what's going on. Yeah, you don't. Actually, not. I, 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 okay, with the game exactly, etc. But go, let's go go broader. You know, go wider. Let's say anyone in in a work setting or you know anyone in any kind any kind of different type of profession you just don't know what they're they all come with their own pressures you know like lorry drivers have their own pressures with stress on the road their teachers have their own pressures with students and exams and parents have their pressures etc so there's so many people who are pressures in different ways you know so you just don't know what someone is going through you know uh, or what someone is thinking about this day so again that's 
why when you have someone like an advocate like Connor doing what he can do, like it's great because again, he might necessarily have the greatest impact on, on a hurler down in you know some parts of the country, but he could have the, an impact on someone who's not got to do with hurling who just captures Connor's video or Connor's message at the right time. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. That's what it's all about. That intervention, that 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 message or that that capturing that, I suppose that that person's trail of thought or that person's attention, you know, to stop them from doing the ultimate. You know, that that's 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 what's all about in my book, you know. It's huge. And Mihal Dunu coming in in uh, 2016, what do you feel like he changed in the setup like to finally get to the over the line? Um, what's he changed? What's he changed? Uh, I'll tell you what he did, right? So he came in and like you would have recognized the early days like that, that we would have had a very good group. You know, let's say not just one to fifteen, but like one to thirty would have been a very good group. That we'd have a very good backroom set up, let's say, with regards to you know all the services you have in the background, nutrition, medical, you know, case uh, analysis, you know, logistics, all that would have been a very, very professional group. So when you look at the group as a whole, there was probably let's say 55 people, maybe more. I can't, I don't know, 55 people. Um, and everyone was 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 top drawer in their field, you know. Even the bus driver, Mike Darcy, was class, class driving the bus, you know what I mean? <laughs> like all those things. So everyone was deadly in their field. So then it all became about them. Right, go and do your job. <clears throat> so he threw an awful lot of the of the, the I suppose the pressures back onto the players, you know what I mean? It's all about us, you know. It's there in your locker, just go do it. So like he again, he he would have often said that that he would have been and the manager group would have been facilitators, you know. Uh, like they're not dictators, so they would have facilitated the group to excel in any way, shape, or form. And that's what they did. You know, they kind of changed the mindset a bit and put put the pressure, uh, and it was warranted. Put the pressure on the players. Let's go and deliver now. You know, there's everything here in front of you. You have the group. You now have the facility. You have the support. And so the caliber of players here. So why not just go and do it? And, you know, and it was. I won't say it was a slow burner. It took a year. You know, to get get rolling up to the 16. Within 17, finally came. You know. So that was his biggest thing, I think. I just think he changed the mindset and kind of convinced the players to be more selfish and to really put the focus on themselves to deliver. And do you think the added, added, added bonus of bringing Lucas in as the strength and conditioning coach Definitely. played a huge role in that? 100%. Again, I'll talk on a personal level, you know. Um, we would never have been asked to do a gym session during the week, let's say, supervised. We'd have always been asked to do it just ourselves. So the accountability was not there, you know, wasn't really there. But then Lucas came along and, you know, I don't know, do you know Lucas is there? No, on a personal level, but he, he could be an intimidating character when he wants to be. You know, he came from a, from a mixed martial arts kind of kickboxing background. So he knew that he could kick the shit out of you if he wanted to, you know what I mean? <laughs> so like, you're going to do what he says, you know? Uh, but he put great structure into it. Like, you know, he put a plan in place and he supervised everything. And he was there accessible 24 7 365. So when there was a gym session in Clarenbridge on Tuesday at seven o'clock, he was there and he was there and he watched you. And like that's where he kind of he, again he put that kind of S and C professionalism into it for us. That we, I don't think we had it at the level that it needed to be at the time. You know, so the next thing, and you start seeing results, you know what I mean? You start pushing more weight, uh, like you start getting stronger, guys getting bigger, getting faster, and then when you get a small bit of a a snippet of that will say, and lads are getting exposed to that, and they see the results of it. It just it's like a snowball effect; it just gets bigger and bigger. And again, ultimately, he became a huge contributor, didn't he? Yeah, and like the year itself, um, in twenty seventeen, like winning the league ahead of that and the Leinster Championship, like I suppose just that winning mentality obviously built a huge confidence in the squad. Yeah, like. The more you win, it's hard to lose, you know. So like that, that league win, I'll tell you, as we straight out, that was an unexpected league win. You know, we wouldn't have had a great league campaign that year. Um, you know, by getting bet by, uh, I think it was Wexford in Pierce Stadium. Wexford weren't any winner, the, 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 I suppose, the, the capability they had to have now, let's say. And that was a draft day, you know, that day. But then like, and they were down, I don't know, we were down 10 points against Watford in like a quarter final or something, like half memory. And uh, clawed that one back. So that was a huge one. I mean, again, like when you start getting over these games, you know, got over Watford, got over Limerick, I think got over Tip. Again, unsurprisingly, got over them quite handsomely. You know, that was expected to be a quite a tight battle and turned into to be a resounding victory. But that kind of springboarded into thinking, geez, we, we can do this, you know. And it wasn't just, 
like it was it was one one to fifty five is the way I put it. Everyone in the group said, "Right, we can do this," and then it became a mission. You know, it became a mission, and sure, the rest is history. You know. Yeah, and like there there was such emotion, I suppose, that day in Crow Park, but. Like, would there be a lot of talk about leading up to the game about Tony Keady's death um, before the game around him? Uh, a lot talked about, no, there wouldn't have been. No, because obviously, uh, as tragic as it was, um, there was still a job to do at the back of it. It would have been highlighted. It would have been touched on, yes, and spoken about. It would have been addressed. Um, you know, he was, a, he was a huge figure for, for a lot of the guys in the group. You know, he's, the guys that say my age, <clears throat> so myself, Aidan Hart, Joe Kenning, I say who would have known Tordy Keady and seen him playing you know, as kids, you know what I mean? Some of the younger guys wouldn't have, obviously. And, like, he was from my mother's parish, Timer Daily, so, again, I'd have known him growing up to say, seen him a lot to say, you know, and he, he, he was always a very colourful character, a great guy to be around and say, so, again, we recognise, you know, that in tragic death, it was, it was obviously a terrible loss to everyone, himself and his family, etc. Um, but, again, we had a job to do, you know what I mean? And as hard as that is to say, I have to say it, you know, we had a job to do. So we couldn't we couldn't focus too much on what has happened versus what we can make happen, you know. And I think by focusing on what we need to do and win the Ireland, it became a much, you know, I, I won't say look at the hurt his the hurt his family went through was obvious, right? But that day, let's say when we when when after the six minutes there was a standing ovation, you know, we won the Ireland, they got the kids got coming to the dressing room. You know, uh, I think that's something that that will be a great memory for them. If I'm honest, you know, look back look back on that very fondly. Um, so that was, yeah, that was kind of the, that was the way it was structured back then. You know, absolutely, yeah, that can great to get over it on. But I suppose like after it all end, when you're doing so much, is there a time you kind of just nearly get almost sick of it from going around bringing the cops everywhere and doing different kind of stuff? Oh, jeez. What kind of sick are you talking about now? <laughs> <laughs> oh God, it was a tough time. I look, it, <laughs> it was a great time. You know, it was a brilliant time. Like again, it was shared responsibility. So like, it's always a big county. There was a lot of players in the group. So twos and threes, you know, got on to every single school in the county. You know, I, I don't know if we get around to every club in the county, but at least an awful lot of clubs were covered. So you sure as hell hope that, that every child in the in the county touched the cup in some way, in the shape of form. You know, and like I remember. Sam McGuire coming to my national school, you know, in 1998, and and uh, and John Dibley brought it up up to the school, and again football, obviously there's no football around. Mm. I won't say there's no football, but football wouldn't it wouldn't be a massive challenger to the hurling, on this side of the, this 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 side of the, the, the county. But uh, again, that gave you like a, it's hard to explain. It kind of inspires you somewhat. You know what I mean? And again, if 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 that's what happened, or if if, if some kid in in Ardrahan or some kid in in Barna, you know, despite what kind of club they're from or what, what status they have, if they get inspiration to it all, sure, it's a great cause, you know what I mean? So yes, it was hard, there was a lot of travel, a lot of late evenings, etc. but I, I think it was it was a hugely positive experience all around, and, you know, players got hold of it as much as the public got hold of it, because it's great to see the giants on people's faces, you know, from all ages. So I saw growing, like, men, let's say, of, of 70s and 80s, that like, would be in tears, like, looking at the cup, you know what I mean? And that that's a that's an experience that like that, that sticks with people. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So like, yes, it affects the youth, like, and they're great, but they're, they're a touch oblivious to it all. They don't understand, the, you know, the the vastness of it all, if you like. But people that say who, who anywhere up to 50, 60, 70, 80, they understand it. Say so. It was great, great to see that. From my perspective, that was great to see. That was the best thing about it. You know, getting to see all the enjoyment on the people that say who have been starved of success for 30, 30 years nearly. Yeah, and like nearly after every team wins all Ireland and Ireland, there's always a talk about two in a row straight away. Like you don't yeah. get a chance to enjoy it. Like, but yeah, I suppose getting back to the final was huge. But like, there would have been a lot talked about. I suppose that she didn't make maybe enough changes. Like, I think there was only one change from the previous year. Do you think that was like a reason that she didn't maybe? Make enough changes in the certain fifteen. Uh, I don't know. I don't think. So. I don't think so. Like, you, know, like, you go back to Kilkenny, Kilkenny there, and, and they're in the height of their powers. I said there was very little changes in that team. Now, I'm not comparing to Kilkenny. Don't get me wrong. I'm just comparing to, you know, the instance let's say of, of, of where we found ourselves. I say with, with with limited changes. You want to put it that way, but um, 
I believe that the 15 guys that started the game against Limerick were the best 15 guys that we had to offer. That's, that's the way it is, do you know what I mean? And I think, honestly, I, I think if you asked anyone on that panel and say, would they have agreed with me? I think a lot of them agreed. I think 99% would agree with me. You know, so again, but like when you lose, you know what I mean? Uh, this, this, these kind of things always come up in, in, as, as a topic or, or a reason as to why you lost. You know, yeah. the year previous, we brought on two subs in Niall Burke and Jason Flynn who made a great impact. You know what I mean? So we had quality, if you wanted to call it, with 17 influential players. You know what I mean? And the year after, then let's say they didn't quite have the impact that they had the year previous. The next thing, it's a reason as to why we lost. You know? So look, I do often look at that analysts, even if you win a game, right? And you see, let's say, on the Sunday game or something, or Sky or whatever. And they're analyzing the game. They're picking out a specific instance that, that they refer as a tactic. You know, and that tactic, let's say, if, from a goer perspective, it might have been discussed at all. But it might have even been a tactic. Just pot look, but it turned out that way for us. You know what I mean? But again, people look at people look at things differently. This is a tactic that goer even played. No, it might have. You know, do you know what I mean? It's just it worked out that way. And the same can be said that when you lose, oh, this is the reason they lost. You know. So like, I don't. I don't believe so. I don't believe so. What I read. A huge thing for me was that year was when you're meeting a team like Limerick who, who have the fitness, fitness levels they have and we come through two, two extra games that were, you know, a killer if you ask me. Like the Clare game down in Thurles to say the second day was that was a cauldron, like that was a, a furnace that day and that took an awful lot out of, our, out of our players, you know what I mean? Even myself included, like even though I was in the goals both in that day and the mental tax, taxation took out the day was huge, you know what I mean? So I can't imagine what it was like for for Aiden Hart to run around after bloody Hodge Collins, you know what I mean? Some of that. It would have been very, very taxing. So those extra games didn't help. Again, was it the reason we lost? No. But it was certainly part of the reason we lost. You know, there's so many reasons. Were Limerick a better team than us over, over the course of the year? It's argue, you know, I'd argue it. Again, it's 50-50 in my book. Are they a better team than going out at the moment? I would say they are. Yeah. They are. But back then, I didn't think they were. Quite even, to be honest. Um, so there's loads of reasons, you know. But the most popular one at the moment seems to be that we didn't have a panel strong enough. So look, let, let people keep saying that. <laughs> I won't interrupt them too much. I have the energy. <laughs> but like, do you think like supporters and I suppose Galway people like, need to realise, especially now, like that winning minor and under 20 all Ireland is great, but like it does nearly take a while for them players to come through to adapt to everything you have in today's game. Yeah. And it's going to take more. We touched on it earlier. We said about how the, the condition up there is now um, it's, it's, it's way ahead of what, what it was 10 years ago. So now nowadays, I say, like when I started, you know, SNC didn't come into like, just until I hit senior. So it didn't come in until like 07, 08, you know. Whereas now you see academies with, with kids 13, 14 getting into SNC in order to prepare themselves when they get, get up to the next level, the next level after that. So it's very, very hard for, for an 18-year-old or 19-year-old to come into a senior setup, you know, and be influential. You know what I mean? It's very hard nowadays. Like, and you need they need years to, to win and adapt, you know. So when you win a minor, especially nowadays, a minor is under 17. So like an 18-year-old kid coming in, he's not going to do shit. Like, you know what I mean? Let's just be honest about it. Like, you know, he's not going to do shit. Uh, because he's too small, he's not conditioned, unless he's an absolute athletic freak. You know, he's not going to do anything. So he's not going to to contribute anything that can get a senior team to success. It's when that 18-year-old is now 22 or 21, 22, and he's conditioned, you know, both mentally and physically, because the mental thing is as hard as anything. I keep referring to that. You know, the physical is the easy part. You just go in and push the weight and you get bigger. But mentally, it's a lot more trend you need to do for that. Um, so goal people, yeah, it's a strange one. Uh, I don't want to put them all in the same bracket. But like goal in their history of the GA, we've won five at Ireland. You know what I mean? Five with Ireland. But I think an awful lot of people in the county would look at our club game and say our club game is, is, is in my opinion, is the top club championship in, in, in the country. But they'd look at that and they'll, they'll say, to them, why in the name of God can that equate to senior success? But it's way harder. There's a lot more to it than that. You know what I mean? A lot more to it than that. And it's just, uh, it's, it's actually a hard topic to cover. Um, yes, we probably have the best club game in the county. In the country. Have we the best county team in the country? No, we don't. Let's say um, it's just it's just the nature of it. Like it's very hard to put your finger on it. And they look at the, the minors 21s, we're winning this, we're winning that. Great. Why in the name of God aren't we having seen the success? But again, I touched it earlier on, like, you know, it's it's a it's a lot got to do with resourcing in senior. It's got a lot got to do with with lifestyle choices. When you come out of underage and head into senior, you know what I mean? You gotta 
you got to sacrifice an awful lot. You got to make this your your main career. You know, and do do all the the, the winning minor winning, winning and twenty one teams do that in Galway? No, they don't. You know, there's there's different choices out there now. There's there's, there's much more routes to go in the world than than, than playing for Galway or Kenny or Tip. You know, so it's, there's a lot more challenges nowadays than what there was a few years ago. Um, so to pick any one reason as to why Galway aren't successful or as successful as as the public should 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 think, um, geez, that's a that's a tricky topic. I have to pass on that one. <laughs> <laughs> and like in 2020, like your final year here in Galway, like there must be some bit of frustration. Like when you look back at the two games you lost, like um, Richie Hogan's, I suppose, minute of magic uh, winning the Leinster title, and like Limerick as well. Like there was, I suppose different chances throughout the game like you did only lose by three points as well and when you see them to go on to win all air then that always hurts like but yeah is there some sort of frustration there that you didn't put on in them situations um, frustration yeah look like I want another Linster medal I want another Ireland medal <clears throat> that's obvious that's why we're there we're, com- we're to compete to win not just to participate you know um, looking at the Kikini game I think we were five points up and they struck two goals. Yeah. Yeah, they struck two goals. Uh, we were in control of that game with a few wides. Uh, everything was going fine. And it was just nearly like, a, it wasn't even a two-minute period. It was just like a moment. A moment the game just turned. The next thing became a dogfight. And when that, you can you can feel it in games that when you're in control, you can keep ahead of the, you can keep ahead of the, the opposition. You know, just that, that, if you're up by five points, you can keep in control by four to five points. You know, you, you're pretty safe. But when a game turns so quick and the opposition, they say, go up a point or two after being down four or five points, that game, to win that game then becomes way harder than what it should be. Because now they're rejuvenated. Now they're, 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 their adrenaline is gone way above the opposition. You know what I mean? And that's the way I felt against Kinney. We were in control of the game. Um, I thought that, uh, that Richie Hope, in fairness, just into individual brilliance, wasn't it? Yeah. And TJ. You know, individual brilliance both of them. And again, once those two goals came in, just their team elevated. Now that's, that's it, their team elevated, and we couldn't be, we couldn't win it. And Limerick, again, we started off great against Limerick. Uh I hear them let's say, I don't think we 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 put the foot in the throat enough. You know, and it's easy. Uh, the thing I hate, I hate people saying you should have done this, you should have done that. I hate that. You know what I mean? I don't like that saying that kind of stuff. It's the fact of the matter is we didn't beat Kikini and we didn't beat Limerick. You know what I mean? That's that's the they're, they're the facts. We didn't do it. So you can say what you could have done, should have done. Facts matter is we didn't do it. And reasons behind it, let's say there's there's I think it's a lot more in the top six inches than it is on the pitch. You know what I mean? Like we should have I think we should have shoved down to six points up, seven points up, eight points up. There should have been a rootless streak in there applied to that game, you know. And the same should have been done to Limerick. And when you get up a couple of points, just keep going hard at the throats all the time. Because that's what Chip will do to you. That's what Kinney do to you. You know, when they're up a few points, they just keep going and going and going until your to the final whistle is gone. I don't think we did that. Obviously, we obviously we didn't do it. I'm not saying we don't think of it. I, we just we didn't do it, and ultimately it cost us both games. Yeah, and like the, there must still be an optimism there for you, like looking from the outside. Like when you look at the new players that come in this year, definitely made an impact. Like mm. Vinton Burke and Shane Cooney coming in, Evan Island even coming on against um, Limerick there toward the end, like and. Like the guy under twenties looked impressive in a few games. I've seen them as well this year. Like so, mm-hmm. like there definitely is talent coming through, and with the main. Oh, yeah, oh jeez, of course there's like, like you look at even I know you mentioned Finton there, uh, and and let's say um and Evan let's say we'll go back a year previous let's say with Brian Cannon. You know, look look how much Brian Cannon has grown, not physically, but grown let's say in in the stature of the game let's say with regard to <clears throat> his finishing ability, his tackling, let's say his work rate. He's just transformed into a different type of player. You know, should he have got an All Star this year? Hundred percent, should have got an All Star. You know, definitely should have got an All Star. But again, media picking that and for other reasons. That's a different topic, right? <laughs> but like, you look at Brian Cannon, you look at Conor Whelan. Have you two of the best inside forwards in the country? Yes. You know what I mean? Look at Cahill Manning. Have you the best midfield in the country? Yes. Look at Dahi Burke. You know, look at Finch and Have you got two of the best backs in the country? Yeah, you do. And so like, when you start piecing these together, like you've got a, a group of great individuals and say, and it's just trying to find the right method the right tactic to piece them together to compete uh, and like we've got I think we've got a great group of guys not just 15 or 20 guys I think we've got a great 30 you know there's a really good balance of a group there and then when you mix that in with the experience of of Harty and Johnny Cohn and 
and Ken and Joey, Ken English say, you know, Conor Cooney, you put those guys in on top, but you know, you've got a you got a great group, you've got a got a competitor, you know. Absolutely. And like for your own um club like in Capitago, like something I really admire, like your hunger coming back like every year, like even after losing, like losing the last three semifinals, the way you've lost them, like it, it just must be absolute heartbreak. Oh, four semifinals. Four. Yeah, four semifinals, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh heartbreak, yes, it, it is, yeah. It looks just again the first year we played Mellows, and what year was uh four years ago, obviously. Again, it was new. <clears throat> it was the first semi-final the club had ever been to. So when we got beaten the way we got beaten, yeah, that was hard to take, you know, but it was kind of like it was new, let's say, and we didn't I suppose we didn't appreciate the day or the occasion that much. The second day, the second year was ultimate heartbreak, you know. We were so close to winning it. Rightfully got back there, uh, competed first well and should have won the game, you know. And then after that, then it just became a repeat, third year and fourth year. Um, hunger, <clears throat> it goes without saying, you haven't won the championship. You know, that's what we as a club want. And again, you look at Paddy Power now tomorrow morning or look at the bookies and say they probably have Capitagal, you know, seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth in the pecking order, right? And that's fine. That's no problem. And again, you look across the county, other clubs, they probably view Capitagal as seventh, eighth, ninth. You know, some of you is less, and that's fine too. That creates its own hunger, you know, and um, because there's not really a, again, there's not really a respect shown to to like what what the club is trying to do. Let's say or what the team is trying to do. Uh, reaching sports semi finals is no is no easy feat. A lot of big clubs haven't done it, haven't reached one in the last four years. I say, but nothing said about that. Now, that's that's, that's a separate point entirely. But um, I just think a, we recognise locally that you know. We have a good group of guys there. Like we have a good, hard-working bunch of bunch of guys. We've got no superstar, you know. We've got, let's say, a good size panel of thirty odd players who are all trying to put the shoulder to the wheel and see what can happen, you know. And then when you couple that with the just the locality, the people in it, with their support through fundraising, you know, we don't have a big fundraiser. We're not in the city, you know. We don't have any big, you know, week on week on, you know, bingo tournament that can be run to raise massive amounts of money and anything of the sorts. We don't. We have just local small businesses that give what they can to try and, and put the team on the pitch in the best shape possible and look there's an appreciation for that too you know so like when you have someone who's you know a, a, a local businessman running one business by himself or one employee and he's throwing in four or five thousand a year into the into the club to try and get you you know a week in the way or try and get you a training camp or try and get you some gear you know there's a huge appreciation for that i think everyone on the team or the club as a whole recognizes that and like we want to do it for the people as much as we want to do it for ourselves, you know, to win. So that's where the hunger comes from. Very easy, very plain and simple, you know. And it's easy to do, like if you if you die off after the fourth one and say, ah, yeah, sure, we'll never get back again. Like that's that's a soft mentality, if you ask me. You know what I mean? So that it's really where 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 we, where we stand right now is well, let's go again, you know. Let's put everything we have. Let's do more. Let's let's train harder. Let's box smarter. Let's do what we can and see where it takes us. That's all you can do. Absolutely. And how would you find um, being involved in the TV series Google Box? <laughs> oh, jeez. How did I find that? Um, I enjoyed it. Look, I enjoyed it. I never got as much stick from all my friends as I did this year, but look, I don't care. Uh, I've ticked again, as I said to you earlier on. Uh, and look, Grace enjoyed it too. That was the most important thing. If she didn't enjoy it, you know, I would enjoy it. You know, it, it was kind of a, it was a shared enjoyment because I was, I was, I was saying earlier on, there was an awful lot of hours going to preparation for the country team. So at least, I got to sit down with her for, you know, a good period of time to say, and, you know, and, and partake in something that's, that's a positive show. Like, you know, it's, it's a good positive show that has you know, positive ratings and positive comments. It's very rare you see anything negative on social media or any kind of media platform about Gogglebox, let's say. So at least that's, that's a huge positive in itself. And sure, Grace enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. You know, a lot of people around the place got a kick out of it, you know, laughing with me or laughing at me. I don't care. You know what I mean? So it was, uh, it was good. And like, who knows, I might do it again this year. Really, I suppose just to finish up, um, a few quick fire questions for you. Um, sure. Who would you say, like through your career so far, um, has been the best player you've played with? I hate this question because I have two and I can't answer. I'll give you the two, so all right. The, be- the two best players I've played with um, is Dahi Burke and Joe Kenny. And as you know, they're two entirely different positions. You know, so Joe's up front doing what he does and Dahi's at the back doing what he does. So, who's the most influential? You have to say Kenny, don't you? 
Yeah. You know, like he's one of the all time greats. You know what I mean? That's 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 the way I look at it. Some of the things he's done, I've seen him done. I'm playing with him since I'm 12, 13. Yeah, we're under 14 together. So we played all the way up along together. And so some of the things I've seen him do uh, just have been ridiculous, you know, kind of out of this world kind of stuff. And like some things that, you know, 99.9% players cannot do. It's only a generation player that can do it. So like I put Joe in the same bracket as uh, I put him, I put, I put Joe as a player. Now this is going to, again, I put him above Schefter. I put him above Kelly. You know what I mean, I, I, I think he's, like, he's better than those as a player, right? Did he have the support and cast around him throughout his career? No, he didn't. Simple as that. Let's, let's be honest about it, you know. If he did, he'd have way more learning. Um, so, look, I'd have to say Joe Kenny. And then uh, your toughest opponent. Toughest opponent. Who gave me the most trouble? I'd have often said, like, again, when you're in the goals, you know, like, you're, 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 you know, shot stopping is obviously one point of the state, but you're trying to organise and communicate with the defence. You know, to stop certain forwards getting into space or to stop forwards getting the ball in a certain manner. And I, I always thought Larry Corbett was very, very difficult to organise against, you know. Uh, when he was one on moment, yeah, you had the clue where he was going. He'd shape his body one way and hit the other side, you know, which is very, very few players can do. So, like, he'd give you the eyes to the left post and he'd fire it over to the right. You'd be going to the left post, of course, you know. So, but then, again, his movement off the ball was second to none. So, it was very hard to actually, very hard to actually look, at, look from behind him and say, right, what part of the of pitch is he actually running to? Because he'd be moving in circles and moving different directions. So you wouldn't know which way the guys would defend. So I always found that he was the, the hardest off the ball and definitely when he's won a moment yet, the hardest to, uh, to read and to, to, to save against. Well, thanks a million for your time.